Fantastic. Now we might boldly begin because I'm just aware of um, making the most of the time and to start right. So thank you for those people willing to introduce themselves. I know we didn't get round everyone. Um, but kia ora koutou, welcome to this session. And I'm delighted that there are so many people who have registered, but hopefully um, will find their way online. It's hard to know from all the sort of, there's a good number here at Otago, so welcome those in person. And what I'm going to do is actually assume that everyone has read the poster and the information about each person and really kind of make the most of the time for each of our panel members to speak. So, um, so what I'm going to do is just let each of you explain, um, like I'm going to say, like Katrina is based at Massey University, Nikki Hare at Auckland, and Rosie overall here at um, Otago. And what I thought I'd do is begin with the question going around each of you, um, asking you how you use um, social media. And that might give you a chance to just talk a little bit more about um, your research as, as well. So, so Nikki, if we start with you, and how you use um, social media, and then we'll just work around the panel. Okay, thanks, Karen. I, I'm probably the least social media savvy. Um, when Karen invited me to be part of this panel, I was just a little bit hesitant in terms of feeling like I'm really not one of these, you know, somebody who's really up with this game. But what I am is um, very interested in socially engaged research, the role of the public intellectual, all of those sorts of things. I essentially don't write for an academic audience, or when I do, it's really to get my work verified for the real audience, which is the general public, and in particular, people interested in social and environmental action. So I am always seeking a public interface. And the main way in which I've done this on a personal level is through having um, two websites related to two different books, which I've written, which are books on the one hand, but projects on the other hand. So both of them, Psychology for a Better World and The Infinite Game, are really ways of encouraging people to get involved in social action and helping them to do that. So for me, a blog is a really, the website and then a blog is a really important way of continuing to keep the ideas fresh mm -hmm. um, and get something out there on a regular basis that explores these different ideas. The website's also a way of people getting in touch with me and showing interest in a workshop and so on. Um, so I tweet my blogs, but I have to say, I don't get a very large response to that. I also have a, um, people can sign up to the blogs and get those via email. And I find that it's what's actually happening is that people are, are emailing on my blog. In fact, I think Karen did that most recently. Um, and then people might join the email group as a result of that. Tweeting, I find I haven't really got um, the, well, it's very difficult to put in a short space the kind of things I do. And I think as social scientists, it's not like we can put out a funky headline saying ice caps melting faster than predicted or something really succinct and strong. So Twitter for me is not perhaps the greatest medium. But what I, what I do want to say sort of really um, sort of emphatically at the beginning is I really believe in only using mediums that you find enriching yourself and I love blogs, other people's blogs. I hate this idea that it's some kind of, you know, self-promotion thing. I actually really enjoy them, so I'm happy to write them. Um, Facebook, I've, I've sort of reconnected because I've got a book coming out and I've put out a Facebook page, but I feel a bit disingenuous in that, to be honest, because I myself am not really a Facebook user, so it's like I'm stepping into a space that... I'm trying to manipulate and use for my own purposes rather than one that really feels good to me. But go on to my Facebook page and like <laughs> it, you know. Um, so, yeah. So I, 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 the other thing I sort of just want to say to finalise this is I really believe in only going out there into the public space when you've really got something to say. And there's an awful lot of pressure on us to have something to say regularly. Um, and that's the pressure that social media puts on us. But if you're much tighter and clearer in what you put out there, 
Um, and don't put this pressure on yourself to, to say something when you've got nothing to say. I actually think you make more of a contribution to the conversation at large. So I, I wanted to put that one in there. Thanks. Thanks, Nikki. And I thought um, I'd ask Katrina to speak um, next um, about how you use social media. Okay, so I was saying before we started, for those who got here early, that I did my PhD by distance. I studied through a university in Perth, but I was living in Abu Dhabi in the beginning and now obviously in NZ. So I had a particular need for um, support, peers, colleagues, you know, that you don't get if you're off campus. So that's how I got started with social media for academic purposes. Somebody must have told me about a group. I think my first one was, was still one of my favourites, the PhD in Early Career Research Appearance group. <laughs> so, and then I'm in a number, you know, for people in my life stage, women in academia, discipline related groups, practitioner groups, I work in education, so in some teaching groups. So I, it's a big part of my social media use. It's not only the sort of public facing stuff like what Nikki's alluded to with tweets and blogs. I do that stuff, but I also have this other dimension, which is in closed spaces that are a support group. So it's, it's another function of social media is, is a place to find support, advice, camaraderie, solidarity, um, a place where you can ask questions and get quick responses, a place where you can learn from each other, encourage each other, celebrate each other's wins, get help when you have crises, that sort of thing. So that's one slice. Um, I was pretty clear as I got through my PhD that I did want an academic career and we know that that's kind of hard to achieve so I tried to use social media strategically to support that so making sure my LinkedIn profile was complete and up to date and being on ResearchGate as well and you know as a beginning academic I didn't have any journal articles to put up but I made sure I put my conference slides or things and you know people began to see and so my first citation actually came because somebody cited one of my conference slides that was on there so I got started on a citation count earlier because I had done that and um, then I now look after social media for the NZ Association for Research and Education so I co-founded a blog for NZRA and I edit that with another lady and that's a place where any of our members can write a piece about their research or an opinion piece. I've contributed pieces and then we edit other people's. So I kind of learned about blogging through doing that, really. I thought it was a good idea for us to have a blog and everyone seemed to think that I was <laughs> more social media savvy than someone else. So I should run it. And it's been great. And it's been another good way as an early career researcher to get some of my ideas out there, some of my work out there, to link to publications that have arisen and also as a way to bridge that gap that Nikki kind of alluded to for us as education researchers we do all this research and we want it to make a difference in the classroom so we've got to get it into practitioners hands so using social media as a way to get into teacher groups and things to you know share blog posts or whatever not from a kind of superiority standpoint, but in terms of being helpful and resourcing and look, we know you're busy, here is a quick readable 800 words on this topic rather than a really dense 8,000 word journal article on this topic. So yeah, I'm on I Facebook and Twitter. I mostly use Facebook kind of for academic and informational purposes these days. There's not too many pictures of my kids and stuff. <laughs> it's, it's a way for me to curate information by following a whole lot of organisations, academic bloggers, people like the Education Council and the teachers' unions and stuff, information now comes to me in my Facebook news feed, so I can be quite up to date on what's going on without having to all the time be going off and checking people's websites, because if they've got news, they'll post it on their social media, and by me subscribing to that, it kind of curates the content for me. So those are probably the slices of how I use it. Thank you. And Rosie, overall. Hi. Um, so I teach in media comms, so I guess I have an academic interest in um, being abreast of social media in terms of how it intersects with dynamics of power 
um, within the broader culture we live in. I also am an avid user of social media. I'd call myself a, a screen person. I'm checking the Twitter feed now. So if you want to tweet in a question, I'm happy to do that while I'm talking. Um, so I use, I don't use, I don't use Facebook for anything academic, though I do help run the department Facebook page, but I mainly use Twitter in terms of, I guess, intersecting with my academic um, profile. Um, and a similar uh, uh, to echo Nikki's point um, and also Katrina's, I really do think as academics, we have an ethical role to give back as public intellectuals. And this is a key fast way we can communicate with a broader audience. Um, and particularly, it's also a hot, hot, hot way to uh, get journalists to cover our work too. Um, I also have a Tumblr and an Instagram. Again, they sort of, but I really blur all of these with my personal feeds. So if you look on my Twitter, there's some curious stuff on there, which perhaps doesn't seem to relate to what I do. So I'm interested in that uh, blurring as well. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now what I'm gonna do is just mix up the order in which I ask um, questions. So I might go back to you. Katrina, and ask about what might be the pleasures of, and we'll, we'll talk about pitfalls later, so mm. pleasures. Okay, so the, the first thing that came to mind is finding your tribe for me, mm. and again that reflects my story as a distance academic, distance postgrad student, but I think there's a tribe for different seasons and, you know, finding my tribe as a woman in academia, finding my tribe as a beginning academic, finding my tribe as an education researcher, finding these communities that I want to be part of, to contribute to, become known and help others be, you know, academically generous. It's not just take, 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 mm -hmm. but also, you know, to hear of things that are relevant and kind of be connected. So that's definitely a big one. Also about, you know, the access to information and updates and opportunities. My current job, I, I only came across the ad because it was posted on a Facebook feed that I happened to follow. Um, so, you know, knowing that sort of stuff, having access to that information is a, is a pleasure of it. Um, it's a real equaler, the real leveler. Mm. So, you know, I've tweeted and emailed really senior international people that, you know, before social media, someone at my stage could never have really contacted. But you can tweet someone and ask them a question about their work. And most of the time, they'll happily respond. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got stuck in the finer points of editing my thesis and the APA style manual let me down, I tweeted APA and they wrote back in 24 hours and told me whether policymakers should be hyphenated or to, you know, that accessibility is really nice. Um, it's also a sort of a skill set that some, many of our more senior academics don't have. So I find that a nice sort of point of difference and something that people like me can potentially bring to a department or a team, um, not wanting to be lumped with all of the invisible labour, but for that, you know, it's, it's a valuable skill that organisations need. And so while other people have different experience, that's something that sometimes we as early career people can bring. Um, yeah, mm. that's enough for me. And we'll come back to you, Rosie. So what, what are the pleasures? Um, well, I guess I'm probably um, pathological. I'm probably addicted to it. So I guess I get a pleasure out of it. I enjoy it, you might say. But um, you're constantly updated. So you know what the latest thing is happening. And certainly in my um, field, media studies, you've got to be up to date with um, how culture is operating ideologically and that works through cultural events, media events and Twitter is a key site where that um, can occur. But it is also a key site, I think, globally to produce a sort of public intellectual culture, which I hope can work as a sort of um, a voice um, to sort of defend what we do, especially in a, in a situation where the humanities in particular are uh, under attack um, through uh, dominant discourse. 
I also agree with Katrina that it is less hierarchised than academic journals where postgrads and academics as well as the public can have a yarn about the issue of the day. Um, and also, I just want to point out that it's almost all women here. <laughs> so in a way, it is really, for me too, it's a site where I think women can connect and get a sense of solidarity and space to try out their ideas, whereas we all know that often in academic spaces, men do dominate, um, say, at conference panels or that sort of thing. So it does provide a different... Um, site for women's voices or non-normative voices. But I also feel like um, it also demonstrates some of the messiness of what we do. If we are sort of reduced to these formalised uh, academic outputs that we rank up and metricise every four years for PBRF, that's not who we are, right? There's an everyday labour that goes into being an academic and doing academia. So that can become part of the Twitter feed. And that's sort of, I think, an interesting point where, um, as I said, my personal life sometimes leaks into my academic feed. But I don't think that's such a problem because um, even though um, the ones who hide behind a journal article might not want you to know they're a human being outside of that, we are actually living these messy lives and negotiating things. So it gives you that space as well, I think. Yeah, and I think that's important. Mm. Thank you. So, Mickey, how about you? What are, what are the pleasures from your point of view? Yeah, so, um, like, really, because I, I more or less only use Twitter and Facebook when there's something that I'm interested in happening right then, um, just briefly on those, I have found them, like, you know, the day after a general election or something like that, a kind of fascinating way to feel part of something that's happening, you know, all over the country or all over the world or whatever. Um, but I'll, I'll restrain myself mostly just talking about the blog space because that's really the one that I use potentially mostly. And what I what I love about writing a blog, um, I love I love reading them because I only follow about three or four people and find but find them really enriching um, and enjoyable to read. What I love about writing them is I'll get an idea. Um, so, for example, I've just got an idea that um, the meaning of life is always particular, and that it's not up to me to tell you what it is. It's up to you to. Um, to look at your situation and make the next move that seems compelling to you. Now, that's not an idea that I invented. It's not an idea that I've only just had today, but it's an idea that suddenly came to me in, in the form of a potential blog. And so what I love about having a sort of occasional blog is that you can get something like that and you can play with it in whatever form you want, to whatever degree you want, and you put it out there and that I don't care that much how many people that read it and respond. Like, I want people to read it and respond, but the act of putting it out there is makes it complete in itself. Yeah. And this is very different, as um, both Katrina and Rosie have mentioned, to an academic article where you do all this work, you put it out there, and then it, at the very best, you know, they want all these changes, or it might be rejected. Whereas a blog, <laughs> just put it out there and that's it, folks. That's what I've got to say today. Like it all, you know, like it all move away. Um, very liberating. Yeah. yeah. So there might be some, like we thought it'd be good to talk about the pitfalls as well. And I thought I'd start with you, Rosie, um, this time to talk about the pitfalls. Thanks. Um, it's something I, I consider a lot um, in teaching um, I teach PR uh, practices, public relations, and this is a feminised uh, labour force. And the students I'm teaching now need to be up on social media. They'll often be hired as social media managers for fashion brands and stuff. And I think women in academia face a similar thing. Um, Katrina mentioned she doesn't want to be lumped with invisible labour, but more often than not, women are the ones managing social media accounts, academic women, not at, um, sometimes administrators, but often um, with restructures, administrators disappear and academic women absorb that um, admin labour. So there is a feminised element to that labour of having to promote the department um, 
and uh, uh, I mean, anecdotally, you regularly have men who could easily tweet or promote themselves through that going, I don't know how to do it. And again, women absorb this. There's also, of course, um, we think, okay, it's, it flattens. You can tweet Sarah Ahmed and she might tweet you back and that's wonderful. But someone like Sarah Ahmed, who I would say is probably a model for using social media, blogging and Twitter to promote her work, um, had an ongoing job at Goldsmiths, which she left, but kind of the security of being provocative in that way, whereas an early career researcher or a postgrad certainly may not have that security in becoming the critic and conscience kind of role. So there's those issues, which sort of says it's not, there is still a hierarchy there. It's sort of, if you're a person of colour, your tweet might be taken differently to how I'm, um, as a white woman, might be taken. Um, it's also, I find worrying that, uh, especially with things like LinkedIn, um, that these sort of SNS spaces are just becoming another metric site where um, we can suddenly count re hearts and retweets towards our um, academic performance. Um, and also, I heard, read in one article, it was called the talk radio of the web. So there is also, whilst everything's immediate and on time, like I'm getting Janelle Monet comes out as pansexual all over my feed and I'm thinking this is fantastic interesting to think about gender politics and pop music um, at the same time I'm getting other sort of noise Trump stuff right-wing stuff all this kind of noise that sort of flattens out around the hashtag so that's another sort of pitfall I think and then of course from my own as I said I'm perhaps addicted to it it can be completely distracting um, so instead of writing I might be checking my Twitter feed so uh, that's another, probably a huge pitfall to be aware of. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for that honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I move to you, Katrina, to hear what you see as the pitfalls. I support everything that Rosemary said, so I won't repeat those. I do think that um, the public facing side of social media, so not thinking about support groups, but thinking about the ways that we might use it to promote our research and things. There's a danger that that can um, reinforce kind of performative culture in academia, that it's all about outputs and impact and citations and quality and quantity and all of that. And it can also reinforce the sort of 24 seven academia culture I read a marvellous article the other day about slow academia as a form of feminist resistance to the neoliberal university. It was <laughs> so you've just got to be mindful. You know, it's not wrong to do these things, but I think it's helpful and healthy to consider the pros and cons, the trade-offs, why you're doing it, how it enriches you and your work, how it contributes to others, how it sits in terms of equity and, and broader context. There's a risk with all social media, not just for academics, that you can um, start to see an artificial construction of reality. Facebook's algorithms are very clever and they, they learn what you like and they show you more and more of that. And so this is how we have two subgroups in America, both of whom think that everybody thinks like them. You know, there's two completely different views of what's right and what's wrong in America and, and part of it has been fed by social media affirmation and endorsement of people's existing positions. So you've got to, not just as an academic, but I think it's important for us as wanting to be reasoned and informed and non-biased is you've got to look for ways to make sure you're hearing contrasting views. And the last thing I would say in the New Zealand context certainly is that it can be countercultural to use social media for the public facing stuff. I don't think many people have issues with the support side, but we do have tall poppy kind of syndrome in New Zealand and then also in some of our Māori and Pacifica cultures. I don't want to speak for them, but we're probably aware that, you know, fuck a ma kind of a, a shyness or that it's it's not right to put yourself forward. You should let others speak about you and you know, you shouldn't try and overstate your own awesomeness and, you know, those sorts of values that are really important to people. And so that would affect how they act in a social media space, which would then create an inequity if those of us who hold a different value set go for it really aggressively and 
what is what's the outcome of that in terms of institutional metrics and things so there's complex stuff sitting around the practice some of you might have come here wanting to know you know how to what do I do to get more people to like my posts on Twitter and we can talk about some of that later but I think these issues around it are important to think about I yeah. agree mm -hmm. yeah. yeah what about you Nikki what what do you see as some of the pitfalls well, again, I you know reinforce everything that's been said so far. Um, but again, as as somebody who's a light user, particularly of of anything other than blogging, um, I I the reason I am is that I feel overwhelmed, and I get it, to me often opening my Twitter feed is a bit like going to the shopping mall. I get a yep. sense of this overstimulation of so many different options and of like, shall I walk into Glassons? That looks like it might be a nice, nice dress, but to properly assess it, I have to actually go in there. So I see a tweet and it, it, it directs me to a link and it's, I click the link and then it's a, it, you know, it looks like a 2000 word article. How much do I read? How much do I give up on it? So I find that it, the sort of constant decision making that's needed um, really draining for me personally. Um, this could, could be because I haven't tailored my Twitter feed very well. As soon as somebody follows me, I tend to follow them back. You know, I'm not a very, I'm not a connoisseur, so I, I'm probably not very good at it. Um, but I am aware of the sort of irony in terms of the academic overload that, you know, somebody sends you a link saying, academics are overworked. And I think to myself, okay, this is an <laughs> So what yeah. am I, to, you know, click on that and add to my workload? You know, this is, it, it, it's so ironic. Um, and I'm not even sure people realise how they're adding to the irony of that. So this comes back to my sort of rule for myself. Only do something when you've really got something to say. So even my Facebook page on the Infinite Game, well, I did spend six years writing that book, you know. Um, I do have something to say. Like, I do have something to put into the space. Um, I just tweet when I've read the whole article. I, I'll retweet something sometimes when I've read the whole article and enjoyed it. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that those are the pitfalls. I, I also just, you know, as a kind of senior academic that probably thinks young people can do this a bit, um, I think what, what Rosie um, and Katrina are saying about the possible exploitation um, of younger, more younger, savvier, um, often female, um, people in this space is a, a really important one to just be aware of. Mm, yeah, definitely. Which is probably a really nice um, segue into thinking about advice um, for, because this is you know part of the early career postgrad network, and I just thought it'd be really good to, to ask each of you for the advice um, on you know, what, how um, early career staff and postgrads can manage their media presence. And I know I'm skipping ahead, uh -huh. if you're just wondering where I am in my... <laughs> but let's, let's do that and then come back to um, cautionary tales, mm. which might weave into this anyway. So um, let's see, who to begin with? Katrina. Okay, well, despite all of these big scary things we've just talked about, I would say don't avoid it. Mm. <laughs> Hmm. it's a useful tool and you are the, the driver and the user of the tool. So, you know, look for it, learn about it, think about how it can be helpful for you and, and use it. I would say um, see it as a learnable skill. It's like learning to drive. No one expects you to know how to do it at the outset. You, you learn it and you, you make some mistakes and it, you go off some bumpy starts and it takes a while to gain momentum. You need input from others who are a bit better at it or have some experience and insight, you need to do some trial and error and have some practice. So see it as a learnable skill and maybe one piece of the puzzle around avoiding some of the exploitation is to, to kind of advocate that message in whatever mm. spaces you might be in. That you know, Using social media is a learnable skill, just like running online teaching programs or writing articles and things it's it's not that some people just are gifted in this and so they should always be the ones who do it 
um, I would say consider the public and the private forms of social media. So be aware that there are a lot of wonderful support groups out there. If you're a woman or a PhD parent, then you can send me an email and I'll <laughs> help you get into the groups that I'm in, but you can find your own, you know, see what's out there. I would um, be mindful about your privacy settings. Check, you know, on your LinkedIn profile, who can see your email address, who can request to be your friend. And you might choose to have things really, really open, and that's fine. That's not a wrong choice, as long as you've actually made the choice and you haven't just like not looked at it and then you're a little bit vulnerable. Consider whether you want to separate personal and professional or whether you're happy with a bit of blurring. Again, there's no right or wrong choice. It's just something else to think about. I mostly do personal stuff on Facebook in terms of what I post. I still follow lots of people and, and get information coming to me, but I don't want to like annoy all of my aunties and everybody with retweeting 8 million academic things. I probably share when I've done something because they'll be happy to see that, but Twitter I use quite differently. And um, ignore the trollers. Ignore the people who are just stirring especially in a public space like Twitter. So I posted an hour or two ago, you know, excited to be speaking on this panel today with Rosie and Nikki. Very nice to be on an all-female panel. And, you know, often there are what we call manals, which are all-male panels. Yeah. And, and um, you know, just a little light thing. And, and then immediately with some guy said, oh, I'm a bit sexist if you ask me. And so Rhiannon from ESOC side jumps on and said, nobody asked you. <laughs> 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 there will always be people like that. If you run a blog, you know, use your settings to make sure that you have to approve comments before they pop up on the public, you know, so the blog that I run, I have to approve comments. And if there are some that are clearly spam, you just don't approve them. But don't take that personally. Just to, I know that that's out there in some of those public spaces and, and try not to let it get too much of your thinking or worrying. Thank you. That's, that's really... Mm, useful actually and I mean I'm living heaps <laughs> Rosie what advice would um, you offer I think that I agree with uh, Katrina it is worth throwing yourself in there because you do um, it's a great way of building solidarity in groups so there's hashtags like PhD chat or ECR chat or shut up and write so S-U-A-W um, which is um, a good way to meet other people working in your field or maybe not working in your field but could foster academic uh, projects. Um, I use it, you can use it for like benign stuff, you know, putting up your latest publications or promoting things like today's event, but then again, someone else might not see it as benign. I didn't realise we were trolled already. Um, <laughs> So I would also advise, again, sticking to the privacy thing. And I make sure that um, actually the uni doesn't follow me because um, if you do follow me, um, my main continual tweets are um, real estate agent copy and university copy. So I say, oh, explore yourself. Who said it? The real estate agent or the university? Not this university. I riff off up loads but that could be seen in the climate we're in as provocative. So I've got it set to private and the university doesn't follow me. But academics can request to follow me, postgrads can request to follow me and you know I'll look and approve it. Ditto with uh, the blog comments there. Um, but I just wanna go back to a feminist politics again, um, again, it, an area I'm interested in, I think we all are. Um, Sarah Ahmed writes that one of the key ways that women can support each other in academia is through boosting other women and citing them. And one way we can do that is through Twitter. Like I've found articles or citations or interesting work um, and just giving other people um, support um, through uh, that kind of boost, basic sort of building of uh, social bonds and connections, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's my two cents yeah. on that. Yep. Oh, yeah. Good. Can I, Karen, can I interrupt before yep. you pass over to Nikki just to echo that and say that that would also be true around whether it's disabled researchers, researchers yeah, of colour, agree. Indigenous yeah. researchers, you know, don't hear us as only caring about feminist agendas, like in terms yep. of the broader story of equity and social justice yep. in the spaces we work in. There's citation politics and, and ways that we can help each other and other groups. I agree, mm. yep. Thank you. Nikki, 
um, advice. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm just listening to all that's been and I'm, I'm just really aware that I'm, I'm probably one of those kind of senior academics here who's in a different career phase and therefore thinking of these things from a different perspective. So, I mean, I, I don't want to sound arrogant and I don't mean to sound arrogant. I'm just trying to say things like they are for me. Like I have so many multiple complex networks in the kind of real world, which actually I also mean email and so on, um, that uh, it's different for me, I think. When I approach, again, it comes back to this overwhelm thing that I actually haven't got over. Um, with Facebook and Twitter, I just, I really do have that shopping mall reaction to them. And I'm wondering, as I think about this, if that is to do with the fact that I'm so linked, you know, I have so many students, I have so many ex-students, I have so many, you know, like I've got 15 PhD students who might ask me for a reference. Do you know what I mean? I've just got this rich interconnection in which people are now kind of coming to me, probably more than I'm going to them. So I'm, I'm almost wondering if the, um, you know, a lot of what these, these feeds and these social medias can do is at particular phases in your life help you build that up. And, you know, because, because of what, you know, we're hearing from Rosie and Katrina, it, it, I wonder that. And I'm thinking if, um, yeah, if they do have sort of phases where, where you can say to yourself, okay, kind of enough, I'm, I've, I've got all of this and I need to have a bit of, clear space in which I just work on my own stuff for a while or maybe this is because I'm I think I'm basically an introvert I'd, I'd be interested actually um Rosie in particular do you think you're extroverted um I'm in psychoanalysis uh, <laughs> I'm so I would say I'm a probably narcissist <laughs> um but I certainly working through my uh I guess so you call it a sort of object separation problem with the phone but <laughs> <laughs> the um, there's a term that um Chantelle de Grille uses called narcissism so we also have this kind of narcissism which is put through social media, but um, we also become almost hardened cynics as well. So it's kind of too negative. Uh, we sort of have the self-reflexivity to say, yeah, I'm a narcissist, but at the same time, we cannot bear to stop the scroll and the tweets and wanting the heart. So, yeah, I mean, it's a broad issue and I'm interested in it um, in my uh, research, which would take, I guess, a more psychoanalytic approach. I don't know if I'm an introvert or an extrovert or whether I agree with those factors, but yeah. I mean, I ask because I think, um, you know, I think narcissism is, a, is an incorrect interpretation of what's okay, going on. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my sister um, is a very heavy social media user, such that, you know, when you're at, you know, you're at an event and she will be on her phone the whole time. And, and one of the things I've realized about that is it might be a bit annoying when you're in the space with her. But the good thing about it is the minute you text her, email her, tweet her, she's... <laughs> You know, so um, exactly, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's kind of for the people who are watching heavy users, it's got a good and a bad side to it. Um, but again, I the reason that I'm interested in this introversion extroversion thing is that again, comparing myself to my sister and possibly you, Rosie, <laughs> she's not. She's not. I wouldn't call her narcissist for a minute. I would call her really interested in being in a constant flow of um, of interaction, of possibility, of openness, and actually sort of relishing and enjoying that. Whereas for me as an introvert, I need these enormous blocks of time to sort of be, to, to be sheltered from that. So I've decided for my, I know we've drifted from the advice, but my advice to myself, <laughs> <laughs> um, as someone who feels I should do more of this is, do it for 10 minutes a day because you can yeah. get quite a lot done in 10 minutes a day. Um, and then you're cordoning off that feeling for me, which is intolerable of constant openness. Although again, I think that might be an introvert extrovert thing, but you're still um, getting the good stuff because fascinating articles do come through and you're sort of maintaining your own presence. Um, somewhat. Mm. Know thyself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. I have to say, I love shopping malls. The thing I miss, 
about Australia is the mega malls. So yeah, we're very different uh, personalities. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is a good sign of a good panel. When yeah, it's yeah. Diverse views. <laughs> and um, so I thought the next question we'd, yeah. we'd go to is um, any cautionary tales, and then move on to thinking about you know academics that you're aware of that you think are using social media effectively um, as as the kind of note to end on, and we're starting to get some questions in as well, so I'll, oh, keep, cool. I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. Mm -hmm. But any cautionary tales, and I don't mind where we begin, Who, who's got a cautionary tale? I, I, I Trina oh, and sorry. Rosie. So we'll go Rosie and then you, Katrina. Sorry, I interrupted, but um, I tweeted, in fact, I said, I'm doing this panel and can people tweet back, back to me what they think about their use and reflect on their use of it? And um, I got a few offline direct messages, so people not wanting to go on the record, which is interesting in mm -hmm. itself, about their own institutions, you know, horror stories of people being disciplined or even in extreme cases uh, dismissed due to um, off-brand uh, remarks. Admittedly, this person was an academic in America where I think it's a little bit more... Um, intense there particularly around things like the current uh, president there so but it is interesting that people feel a bit like they are being surveyed so um, I would be aware of that yeah and New Zealand's obviously a different context I don't think it's as strict as the states yeah mm. Katrina you had a um, caution yeah so I'm in this women in academia support group 10,000 women in academia all over the world and um, it's a secret group someone who's in the group has to vouch for you for you to get in and the reason for that is that there was quite a serious breach of trust now you know one in ten thousand members like the vast majority of what goes on there is very safe very supportive but there are always exceptions and somebody was in an abusive relationship and the spouse constructed a fake profile and it all got ugly and so I think just be again a little bit wise going in and um, be aware that of what you're putting out there and and you know groups like that almost always give you the option to post something anonymously if you feel that it might be really sensitive or you're at risk or something so you can get advice from people by messaging the group admins and saying, could you post this anonymously on my behalf? And they'll say, anonymous post from one of our members and you can see what people have to say about it. So yeah, even in what should be a really safe space, just you know, be a little bit cautious mm -hmm. and, and realize the difference. Someone said that um, using Twitter is like standing at a bus stop and shouting. Like yeah. there is, there's no filters and restrictions really, apart from, you know, what Rosie said about choosing who you who you follow or who's allowed to follow you, but basically what you put up is out there and in the public space. Whereas you know different groups can be more or more more or less closed or private, and different membership criteria, better levels of vetting rather than just anybody who asks to join gets let, let in. So be mindful of those things, and just like you would with friends, you know you don't tell all your friends the same things. You ascertain the level of trust and where is going to be a safe space or a safe person to share this with and so have those sorts of things on your radar as you explore those support spaces. Mm. Mm. Any, anything to um, add? Um, the, the only thing I want to add, it's again, it's a sort of reflection on, on this meeting actually. I suddenly glanced up and thought, oh that's right, this is being recorded and I'm sure, uh -huh. I'm sure you asked permission for that Karen but it's, um, so I'm going to just flip this around a little bit and and put my cautionary tale um, at, at a different level, which is when you're organising events, um, you need to be aware that if something's going to be publicly available, people will be inhibited um, or should be inhibited. Like I, um, I have rules often if I am giving a talk, I say you can film the talk, but be aware I will not be as much myself as if you don't film the talk. Um, I also don't want questions filmed because that's when I often lose it in the sense of I lose that 
careful, controlled persona that I have to put forward. So I guess I'm giving a cautionary tale about the entire space, which is that at one level, we all know that we've got an avatar, or we should. And um, and that, I think, has its own inhibitory um, you know, capacity to inhibit us, especially now that the sort of rumours has it that, you know, even, well, Facebook, all of, well, not even, but sort of everything is, is, is open at some yeah. level if somebody is determined that it should be so, you know, even personal emails. So, yeah. So I'm just aware of um, time. So maybe if we just, when I um, ask about academics that you're aware of that are effective, just maybe talk about one each, if, if, depending on what your list is looking like. Mm -hmm. And um, and Rosie, can we begin with you? Oh, it's actually a re very rich field for the Antipodean context. I think research whisperer Chin Ku and the thesis whisperer Inga Van Merelben, I think her name is, are really good. Um, and also, I mean, Feminist Killjoy, which is Sarah Ahmed's tweet, but she also does the prolific blog where she almost road tests her, um, what turning to her books. And a young uh, woman called Chris, Crystal Abenden, hashtag, I mean, at Wish Chris or Wish Cries, for sort of like, I find her work really interesting on... Um, what it's like being a young woman moving from PhD to ECR. And she's got actually got blogs on do's and don'ts of Twitter as well as her ethics for conferencing and that kind of thing. Um, so they're my few. Sorry, I didn't just say one, but there's... <laughs> yeah, have a look. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And Katrina. Um, well, one that I found really helpful as a PhD student was um, Pat Thompson's work. Pat Thompson is a professor. She's originally from Australia, but she's now at the University of Nottingham and she runs an absolutely brilliant blog on mostly academic writing stuff. And then she cross posts her blogs to her Twitter feed and her Facebook. So that's a, a way to follow her. She responds if you send her an email and sometimes she'll turn it into a post or if she doesn't think it's going to be widely interesting, she just writes back to you and gives you some ideas. But you know, it's not it's not someone live tweeting their research. I mean, she does a, a bit of that and she has separate blogs for projects she does. But what I've appreciated about her is the, the academic writing resource that she offers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of my faves as well. Mm. Nikki? Um, yeah, I, well, I don't have anyone in particular at the, but I, I know, say, at our university, the people who are really good at this tend to be biologists um, that are on Twitter. Um, people like Margaret Stanley and Jacqueline Beggs. And I think part of that is because of the simplicity of the message and the ability to photograph a gorgeous animal and all the rest of it, you know. So, um, yeah, that's all I want to say. Fantastic. So I thought it'd be good to just make sure there's some time for questions. And, um, and there's been some questions coming in via the, the group chat um which i see like someone was just saying that they found it really interesting and they found this not only useful for their kind of phd academic sort of um face on the world but also personal um so thanks from diana she had to leave and what i thought i'd do is just see if there are any questions um here amongst us um first and then open it up to um see if there are any more questions coming in via the group chat Anyone with questions? Marcel. Oh, say something. Mm. Mostly because Karen's put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> and I was itching to say something. Um, thanks, everyone. I, I, I feel like I first need to confess that I'm not a social media user at all. Um, and I'm really interested in, in that um, the intersection between social media spaces and academia because what I'm what I'm hearing and it might just be me hearing it and, and it's not actually what's being said but I'm just a little bit cautious of us using um, social media spaces as an alternative um, and keeping what is increasingly becoming a very toxic space in academic publishing keeping those things intact and using spaces outside of that um, for, for different purposes. 
I mean, I'm, I'm still sort of one, maybe a very old school believer in changing the space from within. Yeah. And I'm just really concerned that if we, and particularly as women, if we're turning to those spaces and not using spaces um, that are already there, classrooms, academic publishing, and changing those spaces, I, I'm a bit worried about that. Who would like to respond? Mm. Okay. I mean, can I, I say something here too, that um, even though I, I mean, I totally appreciate what Rosie was saying about, you know, these metrics now becoming something you can put on your PBRF portfolio or whatever, um, the game is still in academic publications, citations from your peers. Yeah. That's the game. And um, so I think, you, you know, one needs to be aware of that. Of course, you know, I've, I've spent my time in the university only putting some effort into that game. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to say that I don't do that, but I've, I've kept large chunks for, you know, public engagement under the total, under no illusion that that was not the, you know, what was going to get me brownie points. And I think that's still the case. That's what I am still hearing mm -hmm. in the major conversations amongst senior academics. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes um, support groups can whether they're on social media or elsewhere, can be a space to talk critically about the need to change the existing and traditional spaces and how we might do that and to realise that you're not a lone ranger with these things. And, you know, today on the women's group, somebody shared a policy that they'd worked on at the university for how the university's HR was going to advise managers to support women in menopause. And everybody's going, like, that's really significant, changing our work culture and conversations about how we engage with workload stuff, stuff about strikes and politics and how we handle journal publications and how we make the kinds of decisions that Nikki's talked about. So, yeah, I, I don't see social media as a replacement space and still just kind of giving up on the, the status quo in some of those other spaces, but I see it as a helpful space to reflect critically, learn from others, think collectively about what it might look like to see the kinds of changes that we'd like to see across the system as a whole. Mm. I definitely echo Katrina's point there and um, Marcel, I think it's a really good question. Um, but I guess I'm always wary of putting a division between mediated space and some kind of reified real life because everything is mediated if we think of how language works or even as Nikki was pointing out the idea of an avatar whether you're delivering um, a tweet or a blog or a public speech but I also think we do need to definitely not lose sight of changing um, the culture of academic journals as well um, but also perhaps also the culture of Twitter I mean Twitter is known as this sort of home of the hashtag MRAs and all that but whether we want to get caught up in that kind of fight is another thing too. I mean, one of the articles I was reading was saying um, for early careers and postgrads, those um, knowing a bit like Nikki's advice, um, how to filter sort of noise as well. Like you don't want to get up and in, involved in a trolley kind of fight um, around with MRAs who are sort of off the wall rather than um, perhaps working within the spaces of classrooms. And I totally agree the classroom is a key site still. And I'm sure um, Katrina and Karen who work mm. in education would, yeah. Mm. Mm. And just, um, you know, shifting a question um, that's come in via the, the group chat is um, whether any of you have experienced tension between your university's expectations of using their media people for example, huh. and you using your own, who gets the credit is part of the question. I mean, Otago has a strong, they're a late adopter, I have to say, um, have a strong social media. Every department has a social media page. We've got an Instagram. Um, I think of that as kind of a parallel to what I do, though, rather than I use the official communications people to do things like make posters for events and stuff but what I do as an intellectual isn't so much about I'm not really interested in helping build brand build the Scarfy uh, brand so that's a parallel thing that they can do but if I want to critique Scarfy toxic masculinity 
I think I can do that on my own Twitter um, as well. Yep. Yeah. Anything to... No, I don't think so. So I haven't experienced it, but, you know, it seems like another one of these complex considerations are things to have our eyes open to and go in, you know, and, and make your own decisions. Mm. Any other, like, is, there's another question here on Zoom chat, but I'm doing a little bit of sharing it out. Is there any, any questions from this group? So, just while you're thinking, um, another one from um, the group chat is, are there any specific Facebook groups for PhD students, women, that you can suggest? And I think, I mean, Katrina, you've mentioned some in your kind of conversation, but is there any that you would recommend? Uh, well, for anybody who's got kids, PhD and early career research appearance, it's brilliant mm -hmm. and there are a number of offshoots from that including a virtual shut up and write where we all like log on and say who's here today and I'm working on such and such I'll check in in half an hour or whatever and keep each other company as we work from home <laughs> um, the women in academia one is good but you need to find somebody who knows you that's in the group already to let you in there, there must be other PhD ones who are for not parents, but I just happened to not be in them because I found my tribe and it was the, the PhD parents. So I would just go into Facebook and type in the search bar of some, you know, good guesses at, at keywords. And then you could also look in your field, you know, at one point I was speaking to a group of maths education postgrads and so I, I just put in, you know, maths education, education research and a bunch of groups popped up and you join a bunch of them and then you find that some of them are really quite rubbish and you leave again and that's okay but you know you might find a few that are good or if you think that there is a gap then start a group mm. the women's one only started 18 months ago because there was some people that were kind of past the stage of PhD and early career parents either they were later in their career or they their kids had gone and there was a need for another group and so someone started it and it's exploded so if you think that there's a a need for a group whether it's in your discipline or at your career stage or life stage or whether it's because you represent a particular community of either of researchers or just sort of demographically whether it's indigenous researchers researchers of color disabled researchers whatever you can always just start a group and see if it flies mm. and for anyone that was interested in um Katrina mentioned the slow scholarship oh, yeah. reference and that's been sent through but I know that the Zoom chat doesn't kind of, you know, reach out to you. It's uh, um, for slow scholarship of feminist politics of resistance through collective action in the neoliberal university and feel free to email me if you, but just to put that out there while I think of it. Right, what we're going to do is wrap up at, um, sorry, Karen, Katrina. Oh, can I just say, um, for anybody that came wanting a bit more of a how-to, this is a really good book called oh, Social cool. Media for cool. Academics. <laughs> <laughs> so who's that by? Mark. It's by Mark Carrigan, who I think is from the UK. Uh, from the back, the key coverage includes using social media to publicise your work, potential pitfalls and how to avoid them, the evolving role of social media in higher education, defining digital scholarship, managing your identity online, finding time for social media, and near future trends in academia. And it's Ooh. a book that I actually haven't read cover to cover, but I've dipped in and out of at different times, because it's you know sensibly organized and you can find what you're looking for. I just got it off Book Depository or Amazon or somewhere. So if you want something on your shelf to help you think about it a bit more with the practical as well as the big picture ideas we've talked about today, I would recommend this one. And there was a question. It was just a follow-up question, and, and I know I'm sort of harping on this point, and I'm asking it in a slightly different way. It's off the back of the, the query about a Facebook page for PhD students, and so I guess I'm thinking now with my postgraduate chair hat on, what is lacking in a departmental space or a university space or postgraduate cohort space that can be found in Facebook? I'm just, I'm genuinely interested in this question. Because amongst a lot of our students, what I'm actually finding is the problem is loneliness. They feel incredibly alone in those writing spaces. And, you know, what I've really been trying to do with our postgraduate students is foster a postgraduate cohort and bring them together and have these things like solidarity, camaraderie, all these things that I'm hearing, which 
I recognize happen in these other spaces. Why is it that these things cannot happen in a face-to-face -face space in, a, in, a, in an academic department? Like, I just feel I've missed out on something here. That That's a great question, and, and I would hope that they would happen on campus. The reason I looked for, on them, for them online was because I wasn't on campus. Yeah, you're a distance student. Yeah, yeah. And that makes sense, and I totally get that. Yeah, but it would be great if that was able to happen on campus, I think. You'd have to maybe do some consulting with the students. You probably already have, but, you know, find out what it could look like for them and what they would find helpful. Certainly for me and the messiness of juggling work and life and family and study, the thing, the fact that it wasn't just an eight till five on campus, it was, you know, middle of the night, there'd be somebody somewhere in the world who was also up and online or, you know, some so many times, you know, it's a public holiday here in Australia, who's writing and all these people jump on. So that might be one slice of it, the kind of asynchronous, you know, it's not defined to a location or a time. If you work better at a cafe or if you work better in a busy space or if you work better at home than on campus, these things are still accessible. But yeah, I would encourage you to, to keep pursuing that question because I think it's a good one and I think universities should do what they can to nurture our students in, in the campus spaces. Any other comments? Can I just yep. comment on that? Um, in our department, I was one of the postgrads, we started a Facebook group for postgrads. We started it partly as a way to pull in a lot of the distance students, mm -hmm. but what we found is it's been a really good space for people to ask those um, dumb questions that they don't want to go to their supervisor about, or don't want to necessarily have to face up and go, I didn't actually read the handbook that I've lost. Um, and, and it just became a really good place to, to just chat and also just to share like successes. You know, you don't really want to walk around your department floor going, oh my God, I got accepted into my conference, but you can put it on the Facebook and everyone else is like, yay. So it just became a nice little space that was just post -grad. Can, yeah, can I pick up on that? Because that's interesting from my point of view around this idea of who is in the space. So you you felt safe asking those dumb questions and having those confessions in there. Was it because it was post-grad as opposed to the department, which includes post-grads, but also includes potentially your supervisor and all these other people that... You know, you talked about it being a leveller on one, on one hand, but on another hand, it, it allows you to... So it was because it wasn't the department space. Mm. And there's also that scale that's not necessarily, because in the department you're a postgrad student for geography, you're a postgrad student for philosophy, you're a postgrad student mm. for biology. In these spaces, you're just a postgrad student. I think that was it. And, um, yeah, it was, we, we made a deliberate decision to keep supervisors mm. and staff out was and to keep it just as postgrads. Yeah. But we also found that, um, for some of the distance students who joined in because we got our postgrad coordinator shares the link out to new people and it goes through phases of activity and you know as any group does but we found that um, distance students would often be able to ask us for advice and get a response faster from the group mm. than they would necessarily from a staff member who might be limiting time on email or who might not be checking the email on the weekend <laughs> and and so yeah it just means yeah. somebody could pop in and just go oh yeah look i'll pick the book up at the library and mail it to you or something uh, those sort of things so i i'm just going to jump in briefly and just because i'm aware that um nikki needs to mm. go and that some people might need to go at, oh, yes. at 12 um but there is also um anyone who wants to stay on to talk about this a little bit further I'm, I'm going to stick around i think rosie is able to yep so what i want to do is actually formally say you've been a, a stunning panel i mean i've loved it i've learned an enormous amount and i love the fact that we talked about the politics of this and thank you everybody for zooming in and being here physically um it was fantastic to have your support so um, just join me in thanking the panel. Um, I know it's clapping seems like. <laughs> <laughs>